Hello, everyone. This is Rob Satloff. I'm the director of the Washington Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event commemorating the historic occasion of the signing tomorrow of the accord, peace accord, between the United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel under the auspices of the United States government here in Washington at the White House. Um, this is a momentous occasion. Middle East peace accords don't happen every day. It's been 26 years since we last had an Arab state and the state of Israel formalize their relationship. Um, and the hopes for this accord are indeed even greater in some respects than, uh, than what it was um, uh, a generation ago uh, when we last saw uh, the Palestinians and then the Jordanians make their peace accords with Israel. Because the hopes for this are a true full people to people, um, a nation to nation, as well as government to government uh, relationship. And to talk about uh, the background of this accord, uh, the implications on a bilateral and regional level, as well as the hopes for what this accord might achieve. Um, I am really delighted that we have from the Middle East, two of the region's most outstanding public intellectuals, policy practitioners and thought leaders, Dr. Ibtisam el Kitbi from the United Arab Emirates, the founder and head of the Emirates Policy Center, and from Israel, uh, Dr. Dory Gold, Ambassador Dory Gold, um, former Director General of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, a former uh, permanent representative of the State of Israel to the United Nations. Um, I'm really delighted that they could join us from abroad, uh, complimenting our in-house outstanding professionals, Ambassador Barbara Leaf, our Lapidus Fellow and former United States Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, and David Makovsky, our Ziegler Distinguished Fellow, um, former um, Senior Advisor in the State Department on the Middle East Peace Process, and head Barbara is head of our Arab Politics Program, and David is the head of our uh, program on Arab-Israel relations. So between our four guests, I think we cover the entire um, range of issues. Um, uh, we will have a lot to talk about. Let me at the outset urge everyone, um, uh, if you have questions um, that you'd like to funnel into our discussion today, please feel free to email them to me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org and I will uh, do my best to, to manage a conversation after our, um, uh, after our participants have made their opening remarks. Again, that's rsatloff, R-S-A-T-L-O-F-F, -F, at washingtoninstitute.org. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to our overseas guests. I'm very delighted that joining us from the UAE, Dr. Ibtisam el Ketbi. Ibtisam, the floor is yours. No. No, Ibtisam, we, we we have the we're back with the mute. With the mute. Perfect. Speak up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Rob, and thanks for uh, Washington Institute for uh, inviting me and with this this distinguished uh, guest to give my view uh, on this uh, historical deal. Uh, according to the calculus of politics and strategic shifts, we are today in the front of a new chapter in the dynamics of Middle East region. Whether some agree, disagree, or oppose this strategic uh, step, realities on the ground say that we are facing now geopolitical facts. Uh, in my view that the, the Emirati decision to sign the treaty with Israel is an option rather than a necessity. Uh, because there are no Emirati occupied territories that require negotiations between the two sides. The UAE also has no special role like Jordan and Egypt, which were facing uh, existential threats. Therefore, the Emirati decision is rational and based on accurate calculation. UAE thinks that there is an intent to achieve genuine cooperation that serves both countries and peoples of the region and establish a new security system. 
the piece of necessity is different than the piece of option. Therefore, this is a, a piece of option. The, the, the Middle East has seen a real uh, and tectonic shift in the last decade of the 21st century. The Middle East that uh, we have known since the end of uh, World War II and its foundation have emerged after uh, World War I and uh, do not exist anymore in terms of the state sharing type and, and geographical uh, borders, uh, regional actors and regional arrangement for Middle East region. The, the, the region has also seen a shift from states of the center to the state of the uh, periphery and shift in leader states in the Arab world. This is an important historical context for this treaty, which represent a game changer in the region because it will rearrange and redistribute regional power in a way that enhance regional stability and development. Uh, the, the outcomes of this treaty will have consequences that go beyond the Israeli-Emirati ties, ties between Israel and some Arab uh, Gulf countries or ties between Israel and uh, uh, some Arab um, uh, countries. These consequences might also reach South Asia, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, and the new conflict and energy and gas blocks and other forms of, of power. The two parties to the treaty need to design strategies in line with their ambition uh, uh, in various domain, including security, military, um, economy, technology, medicine, and agriculture. Uh, moreover, UAE and Israel need to devise um, strategies to effectively deal with the unconventional threats such as those related to security, COVID-19, food security, and cybersecurity in a manner that contributes to the redistribution of power uh, in the Middle East region. As Bahrain took the, the same UAE step, other countries will follow suit because this will eventually enhance stability and prosperity of the people uh, in the region. I will call it uh, creating an arc of uh, security and stability uh, in the region. As the treaty will necessarily uh, lead to the emergence of a new geostrategic and uh, uh, geosecurity environment in the region, it is imperative to set a strategic framework combined with a precise strategies uh, to control and guide the interaction in this environment. Moreover, uh, understanding must be built with friends and partners in the region and the world in general uh, to ensure that the, the success of this agreement, uh, thereby enhancing security and stability, and eventually leading to prosperity and uh, development in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibtissam. I appreciate your opening remarks very much. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, Ambassador Dory Gold, the president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Uh, Dory, thank you very much for speaking to us from the Holy Land, please. The floor is yours. I missed a piece of what you said because the sound went blank, but you know, we'll improvise. <laughs> I introduced you very warmly. <laughs> thank you. And I will respond warmly. First of all, I wanna thank you, Rob, and I wanna thank um, David, uh, Ambassador Leaf uh, for initiating this dialogue, this discussion. Uh, I think we are at a turning point in the Middle East. And I think new 
um, patterns of cooperation can emerge. And I'd be anxious to hear more from Ibtisam because I think she's thinking in some terms like this from just a little bit that she said. Um, I've studied the Gulf for many years. My first job after I left the Israeli army was to be responsible for the Gulf states at the Dayan Center for Middle East Studies at Tel Aviv University. And my doctorate, I should say, was on the transfer of Saudi Arabia from the uh, area of British influence to the area of American influence. So uh, the Gulf has been with me for a very long time. And, um, and, and for perhaps that reason, I have uh, always looked at it, monitored it, and I can speak a great deal about it, but not, not in a way that would be relevant to this particular uh, conference. One of the things I'm picking up, and I read the British press as well as the American press, there, is, there are voices out there that want to belittle what will be done tomorrow. They want to say, is this really a value? They want to ask that question. And they relate to states in the Gulf, like the UAE, like Bahrain, as mini states. You know, this is not cutting a deal with Turkey, with Iran, who needs Iran, but uh, I'm just saying, um, this is uh, something that's of less consequence. And most of the people who make they, these assertions are completely ignorant about what has been going on with these countries. And uh, just, if I may, with respect to the United Arab Emirates, the UAE has become an important power, not just in the Gulf, but uh, go around uh, the Horn of Africa and you'll find UAE troops, UAE political influence becoming extremely relevant. And of course, we, the state of Israel, are at the uh, top of the Red Sea and therefore, we also touch on that same geographic region. There must be something that can be discussed there, that can be developed there uh, in the future. Um, so I see this peace treaty ushering in new kinds of cooperation, new kinds of mutual understanding. The fact that we are both allies of the United States of America is critical because we can also discuss with our American friends where we think stress should be placed in the years ahead. And I would be remiss if I did not discuss the great threat over all of us, which is the Iranian threat. Some people don't like to talk about it, but it is there. And, um, Years ago, I started an informal dialogue with a Saudi major general. And we used to meet in Europe, in Rome. We met in India. And finally, we met in Washington. And um, one of the things that interested him, I brought with me to these meetings, Hezbollah experts. Because we've been dealing with the Hezbollah problem, I would say, since 1982 maybe even 1978. And what was in, of interest to him is they were monitoring the Houthis. And therefore, our lessons with respect to Hezbollah would be of direct relevance to Saudi Arabian security. But these are the kind of discussions which we could have with our new UAE partners. And um, there's a great deal a great deal to be done. So um, I think we have to also express our appreciation that our other uh, peace partners were not always as enthusiastic, but UAE is showing enthusiasm, is showing a willingness to work with Israel. And what you'll see 
is that we can be very generous partners. My last comment. When I was foreign policy advisor to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in 96, back in ancient history, 96, uh, I remember I would spend a lot of my time in Washington advocating for Jordan. And somebody said, Dory, you are a uh, Hashemite diplomat. But the point is, when we have friends and we work on relationships, we seek to help them. We seek that they, their lives should be better. And I think that is something you'll see from your new Israeli partners when we begin to roll up our sleeves and work on a better Middle East. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Dory. Um, uh, so now that we've heard from guests in the UAE and in Israel, let's turn to our own Washington-based experts and start with my colleague, uh, Ambassador Barbara Leaf. Barbara. Thanks so much, Rob. Well, it's uh, it's a pleasure, but it's uh, it's also a bit daunting to follow Eftesam and, and Dory because I'm going to talk a bit about um, my own assessment of uh, some of these regional dynamics as an outsider, but one who been around the region quite a bit. And, I, and of course, I lived in, in the UAE for three and a half years. So here's the way I assess what happened this past summer. It was an alignment of Emirati sh leadership thinking on a strategic shift for national security reasons, a sort of mini crisis over annexation, long running Emirati uncertainty over the US commitment staying power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the region, and of course, a deepening uh, set of concerns about the roles of Turkey and Iran in particular. So the analysis I'm offering is, is based on what both what I observed in, a, in my years of living there and traveling there before and after, and as well as discussions with both Emiratis and fellow Gulf observers here and abroad. So the Emirati calculations uh, of a domestic nature, I would say, you know, for me, the backdrop is you go back into the past decade when Mohammed bin Zayed in particular began a series of steps to foster a heightened, defined sense of Emirati nationalism, something very distinctive, uh, particularly in the country's youth. And this was propelled in no small part, as I came to understand, for, uh, by concern about the, effect of, of the, the effects of light speed modernization on the small Emirati society you know, the potential of loss of Arabic language knowledge and knowledge of Emirati history in this, this young generation and the ones to come, a fear of loss of culture and, and development of generations that would be wholly lacking in the memory of pre-oil life or what it took to, to bring the, the UAE to the position that it, it currently uh, encapsulates in regional and global affairs. And you know a, a lack of sense of responsibility to the state and to society. So these concerns produce, and and some other you know issues about the region, which I'll go into in a moment, produce the elements of a program which were very visible and striking to to myself as an outsider and others. And that was, of course, compulsory military service for all young men and the optional service for young women. But more importantly or as importantly, sustain public messaging about service, duty to country, uh, educational and, and her heritage events, and then messaging even about things like the National Plan for Economic Diversification was wreathed in, in patriotic terms. And I've had so many Emiratis quote to me, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed saying you know, famously, when we lift that last barrel of oil, we won't mourn, we will celebrate because we will have been launched, and, and I'm, I'm here elaborating in my own words, we'll, we'll, we will have launched successfully on a post-oil future, uh, a knowledge economy. So the, what I also saw was, both from Washington and, and then again in Abu Dhabi, was over the past five years in particular, I saw the UAE leadership progressively and with increasing self-confidence testing the waters of normalization with a small n, as I like to think of it. So UAE press cover coverage of Israel was strikingly non-polemical and straightforward, unlike what you might find in other parts of the region or indeed what you might have found in years past in the UAE. 
there was a, a somewhat cautious approach initially with the seating of the UN Agency for Renewables, IRENA, and the seating of an Israeli delegation there as of 2015. But in 2016, 2017, you had an increasing visibility to people to people contacts and sports events and cultural events. And then what I think of as the breakthroughs in 2018, when the UAE invited Israel to participate in Dubai 2020, not only having a, a pavilion, and this is you know sort of the, the, the big marquee event for the UAE to celebrate next year its 50th uh, anniversary as a state, but also as importantly, and I thought this was very indicative of the trend line, permission for Israelis to travel to the UAE on Israeli passports for the first, for the first time. I, I also saw characteristic Emirati caution, nonetheless, uh, but, but the testing was first and foremost with the Emirati public, secondarily with the region, and of course, a bonus or a dual purpose was really to set the UAE apart from the pack, from the crowd. Uh, in US eyes and in its own eyes. So when I look at then the second set of calculations, Emirati calculations about the region, I mean, here I would, uh, I would simply say, Eptisam elaborated in, in, to a degree that I, I can't match, but the post 2011 turmoil continues unabated. There are deepening conflicts from Syria, Yemen, Libya, and there are proxy wars, frankly, born out of the rift with Qatar and a sense of the region forming into two quasi blocks with Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt on one side, Qatar, Turkey, resistance movements like uh, the Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas, and Iran on the other side. Again, this is the Emirati perspective as I have understood it now for some years. And also a notable issue here, Saudi Arabia, sort of sidelined, a little bit isolated internationally and passing through a very difficult and protracted period of friction with the US. And finally, I will talk about what I view as the Emirati calculations vis-a-vis -vis the US. It's clear from both public and private comments that the leadership was looking at this move, which as I said, was had national security implications uh, and drivers in their own right for the UAE to take this step but there was also a uh, consideration of how this would enhance and deepen and raise the relationship uh, between the UAE and Washington, whether it's Donald Trump's Washington in January or it's Joe Biden's Washington in January. So three, three goals. Position, the UAE is positioning itself well vis-a-vis -vis the US, again, on a bipartisan level. It's taking this big step up into a, a special club of strategic partners, a club of two. Um, and there's a, the obvious uh, corollary uh, benefit of gaining access to certain advanced defense systems that the UAE had long sought apart from normalization, but that logically in, in, in the Emirati leadership size would, would enhance uh, their ability to argue for these. I also, I will, I will say in this, gives me a certain sense of sadness, but it's something that I've seen for some time. I, I detect a certain fatalistic line of thinking in the Emirati leadership in this move as well, that the region is possibly moving towards a post-US era. As a US, former US diplomat, I very much hope that is not the case. But I think that is the analysis in certain quarters in the, in, in the, the region, and certainly that is something that I've heard expressed as a concern uh, by the leadership. And so the UAE is looking at a highly uncertain period ahead. Two successive US administrations seemingly reluctant to shoulder the traditional US security role in the region, an American public weary of US overextension in the region, and both the current president and a would-be de democratic president agreeing on one thing only, that it's time to end America's forever wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and either redeploy significant portions of the US military presence in the region or bring them home altogether. So in that sense, I see this deal as a hedge of a kind. The UAE pre-independence since 1971 had always looked to the protective sheltering relationship of a great power, the UK initially, and then the US. For the first time I see the UAE looking within the region, not for a protective shield from Israel, but rather 
for a partnership with the region's superpower, Israel, as a defense and security partner, and of course, with all the other benefits uh, that come along. So it's not in preference to, preference to the US, but it's alongside and possibly in its stead if the US ever begins an actual move away from the region, which to date it has not done. So I'll, I'll end here and say that the region today is not simply driven or riven by the turmoil unleashed in 2011. It's also caught in the maw of two would-be regional superpowers, Iran and Turkey. And this is where I, I see the new regional alignment that after some talked about uh, providing an immutable logic. And I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Israel and uh, UAE in the context of this Iran-Turkey uh, um, uh, um, uh, situation in the region and the U.S. relationship. Fascinating. Thank you, Barbara. Um, David, uh, um, as we say in America, you bet cleanup. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. And it's good to be with people across the country, maybe the world, on this Facebook Live Policy Forum. Thank you, Rob. And thank you. It's an honor to be with all of you on the same panel. I'll, I'll just, I want to make four points. One is about the, the deal itself, that it, uh, it's really uh, such a compelling bilateral rationale. I would go as far as to say it's an incredible fusion of, of an almost unbeatable combination, a convergence of two countries who share a remarkable, who share remarkable similar regional thinking and a potential economic bonanza. Uh, it's, it's just an unbeatable combination. And maybe here on the regional thinking, um, I, I don't want to go into too much because Barbara kind of got, said what I would have been thinking as well, is these, the emergence of two countries, Israel and the Emirates, who both are very wary of Iran. And of course, the Emirates is going to be very careful ever to say this is done against Iran. This was not the rationale, but are both wary of Iran's influence and both had clear views on the Iran nuclear agreement and are both very wary of political Islam as espoused by Turkey, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and as funded by Qatar. Uh, this is an alliance of two stabilizing countries in the region who, who want to marginalize extremists. And as Barbara said correctly, it has special importance, and this is an American audience, you know, doesn't want to hear this, of course, amid concerns and questions about the U.S. long-term role in the region. How do the countries manage if the U.S. pulls back? We, we're seeing some more uh, troop pullouts, but does it reflect uh, a beyond the tactical, a wider conception of an American pullback in the Middle East as America becomes more focused on its own energy independence, even though we could argue as a superpower, it has very clear interests in, in, in a functioning uh, system where oil flows freely. The second part is the uh, uh, potential economic uh, bonanza. Uh, I believe, and I, I realize the price of oil, these the prices could fluctuate. I think the Emirates has sovereign wealth funds uh, over $1.3 trillion that invest in high tech abroad, among other things. Israel sees itself as the startup nation. Uh, these are the two most technologically focused countries of the entire Middle East, the two most globalized countries of the Middle East. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, I think it, the, the Emirates is the only country in the Middle East that actually has a spaceship going to Mars. Um, and, and you see the prime minister talking about Emirati investment, possibilities in Israeli infrastructure. This was unthinkable when Israel made peace with uh, countries that were strategically crucial for Israel, uh, Egypt and Jordan, but did not have those kinds of resources. Uh, Minister of State Anwar Gargash in a session with the Atlanta Council talked about all, he got very specific about all the economic opportunities uh, that the Emirates sees in Israel. Uh, med tourism, medical technology, financial technology, agribusiness. And you're talking about a country that is now weaning itself out off oil. I think I saw some report in the Wall Street Journal this weekend, 60% of the Emirates is no longer dependent, is not, that it's not 60% of its GDP doesn't come from oil, and it's trying to digitize its economy. And that's something Israel is, is already doing. So we're talking about a warm peace and the likes that Israel has never witnessed before in all its years with Egypt and Jordan. Um, and uh, to hear Emiratis say that, uh, like, oh, gosh, we want a warm peace, or Hendo Teba, the, the ministry, foreign ministry spokesman, said we're enthusiastic. She told the reporter this weekend that Israel is not used to hearing that from an Arab country. 
Now it's helped that Israel and the Emiratis have never faced each other on the battlefield. There's no baggage here. Um, so anyway, that's, it's just a war and peace possibilities based on the convergence of, of strategic thinking and based on uh, these two countries so globalized, so focused on technology that uh, I think the sky is the limit. Um, so that's that. Now, why now? In this sense, that, that's my second point. The, the idea of, of um, this was an unintended peace process. If we had a period, you know, put the 2020 in, into kind of, uh, for people, you know, so much news going on with COVID, people don't think about this stuff every day like the few of us in think tanks do. But basically, there, I would put it in, there was 2020, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. 1.0 was the Trump peace plan. And yet it hit, it hit, uh, it hit a rock because the Palestinians uh, hit a wall, so to speak, because the Palestinians rejected it out of hand without even seeing it. But it also hit a, a wall because Netanyahu could not galvanize the Israeli right. Uh, and I think he, he did not, you know, condition the landscape uh, in his own base on why a, a territorial compromise is important to avert the external pressure of a one state solution. We could talk about it in the Q&A. We've talked about it on other occasions. Dennis Ross and I just wrote a book on this, um, Be Strong and of Good Courage. 2022.0 was annexation. That once that uh, Trump plan hit, hit a wall, uh, but that also hit a wall for a variety of reasons. A lot of international uh, angry reaction, including also internally Israel's strategic community saying there's no strategic advantage here for Israel. Ironically, that led to 2023.0 where the Emirates almost you know, bailed out uh, you know, the U.S. and Israel in this regard. I, and I, I do want to salute the, the, the Trump administration and Netanyahu. I don't want it to sound uh, churlish at all. This is a first class achievement. Uh, it's really crucial, as I've tried to just say until now. So nothing derogates, denigrates from that at all. Uh, it didn't require the risk that Rabin took, that Begin took when he gave up the Sinai, that Rabin took when he brought Arafat in. It's a different sort of piece, of course, but it's still a great achievement. I think the logic of peace is what I said above and what Barbara and Abdesam and Dori have said. But I think what also helped was the Emiratis have brilliant leadership here in Washington with uh, Yosef Oteba as their ambassador. And they clearly seized a, a political tactical moment, namely that Trump is facing an uphill election. And when you're facing an uphill election, you want every breakthrough you can. And that gives you ability to extract full dollar from the United States. F-35s is something <clears throat> the Emirates has wanted since 2012. Um, so that should not be discounted. And the other thing, which ironically does not contradict, uh, but actually converges, is the, the desire of the Emirates, I think, to position themselves to buy political risk insurance for a post-Trump era, uh, given that the Democrats uh, on the Hill might not always see uh, the Gulf states is the flavor of the month, the way the Trump administration has seen it. If the, the new administration would focus on renewing the Iran nuclear deal. So this could help buy some political risk insurance for the Emirates. Now, the third point I want to make is just that, is that uh, there needs to be a real rethink. Uh, what the Emirates has done, and I, we, we should mention Bahrain. I just, if I had more time, I would get into the Bahraini thing. I hope there'll be Q and A about Bahrain. But what has happened here is, is that the old paradigm of, 20, of 2002 has crashed. That's the Arab Peace Initiative. And that was based on, on premises that were probably valid for, for 2002, which is there's not that much bilateral relations between Israel and the Gulf. And therefore, this is an over the rainbow thing. When Israel and the Palestinians reach a deal, um, you know, then the Israel and the Arab states will reach a deal. But it was based on the idea if you had to wait a generation, you wait two generations, you wait because there was no common interest. It was like an Arctic circle, a frozen area where there's no bilateral uh, commonality. But what's happened is that was once considered a carrot in 2002 is now a stick in 2020 because the region has changed. What changed? Iranian regional influence, the, the Iranian nuclear program, ISIS, uh, the political Islamic focus of Turkey and of Qatar's funding. All of a sudden, it seemed like a stick. What, you want us to wait on relations with Israel? What, for another generation? We have common interests, common regional thinking, common economic interests. And we've waited 18 years. There has to be a rethinking. It's breathtaking. Sometimes the developments happen so fast, we don't put it in perspective. 
but, but our listeners, our viewers here should think for a second. In 1979, when there was a treaty between Egypt and Israel on the White House lawn, uh, what happened? The Arab League left Cairo as an act of protest for 10 years, left Cairo and was in Tunisia uh, until it reopened in Cairo in 89. Um, but last week, when the, when the Palestinians went to complain and tried to get Arab League condemnation, the Arab state said no. Why? Because they said this is a sovereign decision of an Arab country. It's breathtaking. We just don't think about these things sometimes. How on one hand, when there was a sovereign state, the biggest sovereign state in the Arab world, Egypt, that actually housed the Arab League, the Arab League left the country for a decade to protest. And now they rebuffed the Palestinians. That to me tells me that things, this is not your mother or, or grandmother's Middle East anymore. It's, it's a new region and there has to be a rethink. And instead of the Palestinians cursing MBZ and the UAE, they need to coax them to come back, to use their resources in a way that this is not just a bypass road, this is a bridge that could help them. But there's such anger, I'm not holding out any belief this will happen. The next step will be the US election. The Palestinians are gonna to wait to see what happens there. But in the big picture, when things settle down, there needs to be a rethink because the API classic paradigm is dead. The final point I'll make is just, uh, there's a clash of clocks that I think in Washington we haven't totally focused on. Uh, look, we've seen visits to the region in the last month of Secretary of State Pompeo, National Security Advisor O'Brien, Jared Kushner, uh, all to the region. What haven't we seen? Who has not visited? The Pentagon. Uh, this issue of, on the F-35s, I think requires Pentagon-Israeli consultation. And why isn't it happening? I think what's happened is that the clocks are not in sync because basically the administration, and I think tacitly Netanyahu, although he will deny it vigorously, basically want this wrapped up all in this calendar year, do not want any business of this treaty left over until January if the Congress changes, the administration changes. They wanna push this through, and I can understand them, and I clearly for the Emirates, the F-35s was a key element of this deal. But there needs to be, I think, some Pentagon-Israeli consultations on what does it mean to have F-35s? And would it, what would it be if there was a multiplier if it was sent to Saudi or Egypt? Uh, this is a big deal. Now, I want to be clear that both the United States and Israel have said of reaffirmed QME, the qualitative military edge, it's the U.S. law about weapon sales to the Arab states, about technology um, that... Uh, that are limited because of a, a possible clash with Israel. The Emirates has never fought Israel. The Emirates is about to embark on an amazing new relationship with Israel, and this should not be denied, and maybe there needs to be some rethinking of the shape of QME. But, but what's happened is it's clear to me that there needs to be some consultations. The defense establishment in Israel needs to be brought in. They've been left in the cold as the political figures, both in Washington and Jerusalem, I think are in a fast track mode. So to me as an analyst, it is just gonna be fascinating to look at these clash of the clocks and whether they're gonna be synchronized and whether we're gonna see Pentagon-Israeli consultation and maybe a new redefinition of QME. So I, I think this is something that, that people who follow this issue need to look at the difference between the vantage point of the politicians and the vantage point of the defense planners. And is there a way that this could be brought into sync or is one just gonna, you know, just have to be put aside or not? But it seems to me this question of consultations needs to be addressed. So those were the four issues I wanted to talk about, the rationale of the deal, the timing of the deal, the implications for the Arab Peace Initiative and the US-Israel cross uh, during this political season. Thank you all very much. Very good. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, the four of you, you've given us a lot of food for thought. We now have about a half an hour to uh, delve into some questions. Um, both Barbara and David spoke about the American angle of what is uh, happening tomorrow at the White House and its uh, implications. So I want to go back to Ibtissam and Dory and ask both of you about the American angle. Um, uh, Ibtissam, what uh, I'll ask you, what, what does the Emiratis, what do the Emiratis um, hope to, uh, uh, to achieve um, uh, in the broader relationship with the United States as a result of 
um, this new opening with Israel. Um, and Dory, if you can, you spend so much time focusing on uh, regional security issues, if you could also um, give us your view on the uh, um, uh, I mean, F-35 is, is as much as anything, it's a, a symbol of a broader question of the implications for, uh, uh, Q, for QME um, and understanding um, the security implications of this deal um, um, for Israel and the U.S.-Israeli relationship. So let me begin first with, uh, with Abdesam. Uh, Rob, uh, I think since the U.S. changed its uh, strategic assessment towards the region and pivoting towards Asia, without consultation even with its allies uh, uh, in the region and, and forming that deal with, with Iran also, uh, well, I know that uh, Obama's think that deal will bring peace uh, to the region. Of course, not uh, with the conditionality with, with, the, with the regional fights uh, in the region. What was the big mistake of that deal or big default for that? For that uh, and so at that time, GCC and the allies in the, in the, in the region uh, felt that they've been left alone. Okay, now, or, or what Obama's called that leading from uh, behind, but not consulting with them regarding the deal, not consulting with them regarding pivoting. Uh, and you know, US giving them a, a security umbrella. So, so at that time, they thought to diversify their strategic partnership looking to the Asia as well, to China, to India, to Russia, to other, but still, of course, the, the, the main guarantee for their security, uh, US. Now, this is step that this deal with the help of US uh, reassuring that US still in the region, still caring for the region, not making a deal and leave. Uh, US will, will, will uh, make a great mistake as it did when made the deal with Iran, that if this deal, thinking that uh, just hit and run. No, you have to be there to guarantee that this deal. Well, let me say something here, which is I find it for me contradictory. Now we are talking about normalization, okay? with Israel, and UAE took a courageous step towards that. Uh, okay, condemnation, blaming from Arab street, for, from Palestinian, from other uh, countries. And at the same time, you have another US ally and another, I won't say ally, but another has normal relation with Israel. I'm talking here about Qatar, okay? inflaming the Arab street, using all its media outlets, okay? Uh, uh, naming and shaming anybody looking at this deal or saying this is a good deal for both uh, uh, Israel and UAE and for the, the regional security. This is, does not, uh, uh, from my view, fit in this, uh, if I want to say the, the frame, of normalization, of stability. So here, both Israel and, and US, either they want this to go and involve more Arab countries, uh, uh, because this is the main barrier for any countries uh, to, to, to join this deal. The other barrier, of course, that uh, Israel, uh, settlement, Israel aggression towards uh, Palestinian. Uh, this is also hinder any, I mean, uh, any country that wants uh, to join this uh, arch of, of stability or this deal. So each one, US uh, has duties, uh, Israel has uh, duties, all 
countries in the region, they want uh, to live in peace, they have their own duties now. Here, don't blame if, if Turkey or Iran hijacking the Palestinian issue, inflaming the Muslim world, that UAE is uh, uh, betraying the Muslim world, betraying the Palestinian. But, so UAE cannot stand alone in this. It needs US to uh, help in this regard, help in this uh, stopping its allies, pushing others for more normalization, paving the road for each party to jump in this, uh, in this deal. Okay, thank you. Um, Dory, very good. Dory? What's the question? Uh, 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 your view of, um, uh, your response to David on the issues of, um, uh, 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 well, I'll, I'll actually, I'll quote you. Um, you. In your remarks, you said, um, uh, 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 just look how we are going to be in Washington advocating on behalf of our new partners. Um, we did it with the Jordanians a generation ago. Just look how we're going to do it with the Emiratis today. So does that, uh, does that extend in the narrow frame? Does that extend to uh, F-35s? And more broadly, how does that extend to a rethinking of um, uh, uh, the implications of this relationship for Israel's QME? Well, I know we are all obsessed and locked onto the latest issues that the um, peace treaty is generating. Um, we actually do have a, a legitimate argument about QME, but I don't think we have the time now to go uh, in depth on this. Um, when we talk about QME, qualitative military edge, I want people who are watching this from the United Arab Emirates to understand that it's not against them. That QME, uh, if Israel suddenly says, you know what, we can go easy on this, who cares? The um, ultimate response, the ultimate uh, effect uh, will be on other Arab states who are not at peace with us, who might try to exploit Israel pulling back on QME for themselves. I mean, just imagine F-35s go to, uh, go to the UAE, so then Qatar asks for F-35s. So you could say, well, Qatar is a mini state and um, isn't like the kind of, doesn't represent the power that uh, the uh, UAE represents. But, um, you know, Qatar is, can partner with some of the most dangerous countries in the region. So it is something which we have to continue to be concerned with. And I'm sure uh, an Israeli government will uh, raise this issue and um, perhaps talk to the U.S. about you know, what are our exact concerns and with proposals of how do we address them. Uh, I think what might be more useful for us to do, many times I think about um, what kind of security structures can emerge in the Middle East in the future. And I think my, what might be useful for us to do is to consider how you create a regional security system with Israel, with the UAE, and with other partners we recognize who could uh, play a role. In many respects, we are today in a position very similar to that of the Europeans at the end of World War II, who faced an American army that was planning to pull out of Europe and a Russian army that planned to fill the vacuum and to uh, 
create a balance that would guarantee European security back in 45, 46, 47, the U.S. under its leadership created NATO. Now, I know when you say Middle Eastern NATO, you get immediately a bunch of editorials that are annoying. But, <laughs> but we, security structures are very important in light of changes that are likely to occur. And if you have partners that know how to work together, and that show an interest in working together, you can help design a, I don't want to say a new Middle East, that's a term that was, uh, got too much mileage in the past, but a different Middle East. And a Middle East based on the stable players and not the players in the region that want trouble. I'll stop here, otherwise I'll talk for too long. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Um, uh, so Barbara, um, uh, I wonder if I have a number of questions from our guests about um, how other Arab states are reacting to this, um, how they are likely to react if they see this is successful. Um, I mean, we already know about Bahrain. Um, uh, 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 we've, so I want your views on sort of regional repercussions, uh, but also I have a number of questions uh, questioners pointing out to me, um, the Emirates have have had a sort of maverick foreign policy for a number of years, um, uh, um, a willingness to uh, deploy um, it, their military in various countries around the region, willingness to pull out, pulling out of the Yemen war uh, and differentiating themselves from the Saudis, for example. Um, are there, are there, um, uh, in your view, are there future maverick steps that you can imagine uh, the Emiratis taking now that they've taken this important maverick step? So I'll, yeah, I'll take that set of questions first and then come back to the regional dynamics. Um, you know, maverick is, yeah, is one way to describe it. I mean, uh, taking risks, you can take risks for war, you can take risks for peace. Um, and we've seen that mix of things uh, coming from Abu Dhabi in, in the last few years. Now, certainly uh, the, the, the play for normalization or the, the step the, to, to normalize with Israel is a strategic one. And it was methodically, carefully thought through and to my understanding really just accelerated what was a trend line that probably would have involved this this step somewhere down in the next two to three years, but it was accelerated by all the events that we've discussed. <clears throat> but the, the maverick, if you want to call it, uh, other people have used harsher terms, uh, uh, aspects of UAE foreign policy, that um, is something that Washington is, has been wrestling with. Um, and uh, a democratic administration will wrestle even more clearly with with it, or maybe not wrestle at all, but will be more critical of it. Now, look, um, every country, every mature country, it takes its own reckoning of threats and challenges and how to address them. Does it try to do it alone? Does it do it in coalition? Does it do it militarily at all? Um, I see the UAE having tried some of these new tools out first in Yemen and then in Libya. The cost became too high in Yemen cost to the UAE, the cost to its reputation in Washington and Europe. Uh, and and uh, Mohammed bin Zayed made a very hard nose assessment that the continuing um, risks and damage outweighed any notional benefit or out, you know, had, had surpassed the mission uh, that, that originally framed his decision in 2015 to intervene with Saudi Arabia and other countries. I say it's hard news because it came at a cost, a certain cost, to the relationship with Saudi Arabia. But again, as a, you could say, uh, as, a, as a mature country calculating its own, its own national security interests, the UAE pulled back. It has not yet made such a calculation on Libya. I look forward to the day because I think Libya is a perfect example of overreach and, and 
really quite um, quite uh, significant damage. Its damage with the collection of other partner, partners ranged on either side of, of, uh, of the east-west divide. So other countries outside the region, of course, as well as Egypt. That also will play into how people in Congress, at least, look at the question of the F-35 or indeed at any uh, sort of QME busting or potentially busting uh, defense systems. That will inevitably uh, be part of the spectrum of issues that US members of Congress look at. They always do. On the issue of the regional dynamics, I think it's quite interesting. One of the things I didn't, I meant to address up front, but didn't, uh, didn't was my thinking about where US policy ought to be focusing as next steps. I mean, it's clear that in the short term, the administration uh, deploying its senior most officials has been really, you know, arm twisting and pressing and cajoling. And, and here we have Bahrain has stepped forward. Myself, I think it's, it's, there's a risk here of this administration or another one getting so wholly focused on notching up wins on normalization at any cost or on a wholly transactional basis. And that will cause friction and distortion of other policies. And as an example, QME. So for me, the question is in the face of reticence, some resistance, uh, some folks just simply still thinking it through, but certainly not ready to jump forward. The question for the US should be not so much, how can we notch up more marks on the, on the, uh, on the board, but rather, how do you build on the, the breakthrough that has already occurred? First with UAE, now with Bahrain, but build on it strategically for wider regional stability, eventually towards the issue of, of trying to help towards resolution of the Palestinian issue in concert, obviously, uh, with Israel. So the better part of valor for me would be to respect the reticence of other Gulf states and other states around the region, Morocco is an example, on the pace of official normalization while recognizing that there are some foundational issues here. One is their own domestic audiences, which are resistant. Some places highly resistant to normalization. In some places, it's simply fear of other countries, Arab, the so-called street. But what I think is important that the U.S. can do in partnership with these partners around the, 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 the region is to encourage them to do what the UAE has been doing for years. And I go back to what I said originally, which is, it wasn't just testing in, an, in a vacuum, testing the idea of normalization. It was reshaping the public climate in the UAE and specifically the climate for its own citizens about normalization, about with interfaith uh, efforts, with again, changes in press tone, loosening strictures, turning, the, you know, turning a blind eye to certain contexts. But this is what other countries, including the Saudis can do, loosen strictures on, pe on people to people contacts, change the tone in government media above all. Don't trample all over everybody's you know, press freedoms, but if, you're, if, if it's government media, then by God, that tone ought to shift. And yes, engage in things like interfaith, uh, interfaith efforts, because that does begin to change the environment in which one's own citizens are thinking about what everybody used to and some people still call the Zionist entity. You don't see that kind of language in UAE press. It's Israel, full stop. So it's, it's things like that that I think the US should really start focusing and not just simply notching up um, you know, wins on the normalization board, which might come, which might not only risk distorting our other policies, but might push governments into a place that their own publics aren't yet ready for, but could be ready for mm -hmm. with some change in the environment. All right, thank you. Um, I received uh, quite a few questions from listeners around the Middle East or viewers around the Middle East uh, on um, uh, uh, Palestinian uh, connection to um, uh, the UAE Israel uh, breakthrough. And so let me ask, um, let me ask a couple of questions about this. Um, uh, so let me start with you, uh, Dory, and then David, come on in. Um, 
It was only a couple of months ago that the Israeli leaders were saying, um, this is a historic uh, um, uh, uh, moment. Um, uh, the stars are all aligned. Um, we had better annex territories in the West Bank now to take advantage of this unique opportunity to transform our relationship, not only with Palestinians, but, but shift the fundamentals of, um, of, of how people even think about a potential um, uh, peace uh, relationship with Palestinians. And then that historic moment came and went when uh, the UAE offered a choice, annexation or normalization. So um, uh, 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 Dory, should we assume that we now clearly understand Israeli national priorities, that the priority is normalize more broadly rather than redefine Israel's uh, borders with Palestinians by ourselves? Is that now a clear national choice that uh, this, uh, that this um, government of Israel and the Israeli national security establishment has taken? And David, um, what can be done to build on that choice to in fact re-energize, um, if not in the waning days of this administration, but after January 2021, whether it's Trump two or Biden one, um, what can be done to re-energize um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking while um, uh, broader normalization um, proceeds between Israel and Arab states? Dory? Well, I don't want to um, get us back into the muck of Israeli-Palestinian um, diplomacy that didn't work. Um, and I think the key, if you want to go down that route, is whether the Palestinians are ready to pick up reasonable uh, proposals and work with them. Right now, they're not. You know what? Towards the end of the Obama years, and we have David Mukovsky here who was, uh, you know, involved in, the, in some of those efforts. Um, towards the end of the Obama years, when um, the Obama administration's uh, proposals were placed in front of Abu Mazen in the Oval Office, and Abu Mazen says, you know, I don't have an answer for you. I'll get back to you, 2014. So why do I, why am I harping on that? Because obviously Abu Mazen wasn't ripe for a deal in 2014 as he isn't ripe for a deal now. But, but Dory, I'm, I'm, I'm asking a slightly different question. I'm asking a question about Israeli national priorities. Is it now clear that the Israeli national priority is um, broadening and normalizing more broadly rather than a unilateral statement about what our borders may or may not be with Palestinians? Well, you know, I, I don't like using the term annexation, and I've written quite a bit why this would not be annexation. But um, I think that if you're going to have any kind of resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on modifying borders. Israelis, since the time of Yigal Alon in 1967, have said certain territories in the 67 period would be retained by Israel and certain territories would be given back. And I think we all adhere to those principles today. Um, but I don't think that we want to really get into the whole question of so how much are we taking for us? You know, it's, uh, in fact, the Trump plan is pretty clear that in the West Bank, maybe 30% goes to Israel, but 70% goes to the Palestinians. So, you know, that's already out there. And um, when we accepted the Trump plan, we accepted those divisions as being relevant for the future. Um, right now, I, again, I'm sort of, I don't want to repeat myself, but I think right now we have an opportunity to think with Arab state partners of how the territorial configuration in a peace settlement could be affected by our new relationships. 
And for example, you know, the Palestinians need to have an arrangement that allows them to considerably increase their GNP. What if we have routes for trucking and for trains that begin in Haifa, cross the West Bank, cross Israel, cross the West Bank, go into Jordan, and bring us out to the Gulf? And the Palestinians financially benefit from being conduits of trade that could emerge as a result of some negotiated arrangements on, um, on territorial configurations. I, have, I worked extensively on how, you know, the Egyptians never wanted to give up one ounce of Sinai to the Palestinians in Gaza. Um, so we looked at, well, what would happen if, you know, we had an arrangement in Sinai that Israel invested with Western help in a certain portion of territory. And, um, you know, that territory would become, um, it would become Sinai, how would I put it? It, would, it wouldn't become territory that the Palestinians annex, but it would be uh, Egyptian territory, which a group of countries repair, fix, upgrade. So there are things that have to be thought out that could have positive ramifications for the Palestinians. Tonight, today, before the signing of this deal, I don't know if this is the time to really get to get into the weeds on this. Okay. But I think that the uh, peace between Israel and the Arab states and the peace with Israel can interact and create a better outcome for the region. All right, very good, thank you. Um, David, uh, if you could be, uh, if you could be um, brief on this without going into too many details, but how can we take the US, the, uh, the, um, the Emirati-Israel Accord and use that as um, a platform for um, playing back into the Palestinian issue in a positive sense. And then I'm going to go to Ibta Sam. I have a, a question I want to uh, uh, pose to her. But first, David, to you. Look, it, there might be a need for another peace, but it might be a need for an internal Arab peace between the Emirates and the Palestinians. And it's not going to happen so quickly because I'm sure the televisions in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai are showing uh, photos and, and the like of... Uh, pictures of MBZ uh, being disrespected in the West Bank and the like, and that's creating a lot of bad blood. Um, and uh, it didn't start with the peace treaty, Rob. It's very important to note here, this predated it. It had something to do with also Abbas's rival, Mohammed Dahlan, being welcome in Abu Dhabi and being was close to MBZ and TBZ, the, the, the Tahnu bin Zayed, the National Security Advisor of the Emirates. But, um, and of course, in the Arab, in the Palestinians, everything is a muamara, everything is a conspiracy theory that this is being done now to help Mohammed Dahlan win the succession struggle in the post-Abbas period. Now to an American audience watching this on Facebook, this is gonna sound bizarre, but if you're a Palestinian, it isn't. The, the muamara is, is a reality in their view, and it will not be fixed immediately. But as I said in my remarks, this does not have to be a bypass road. This could be a bridge. Look, the, the, the Ben Zayed, there's a whole neighborhood of Ben Zayed in Gaza. There could be five Ben Zayeds in the West Bank, but there has to be improved relations. And I don't know if it's possible with Abbas, even if he's at the end. And clearly the Palestinians are waiting on the American election. They don't want to move because they think the American elections could change the whole dynamic. But I think there has to be now, Emirati uh, Palestinian rethinking. Look, imagine, I'm not saying this, this requires a lot of brainstorming, but instead of Qatar giving $30 million a month to Gaza, imagine if the Emirates could do that. I mean, we could think anew, like Abraham Lincoln said in the second inaugural, think anew and act anew. But this requires improved internal Arab relations that are right now in a terrible position. You've heard me a hundred times. I don't want to go on and late on this. I know we don't have time for this, but we can't hit the home run ball on the Palestinian issue now. We tried three times. I was part of the third effort. 
um, but we can hit some solid singles. If you give me more time, I'd explain what the singles are. Uh, but uh, well, what is, you'll have to explain what home runs are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but there are gradual moves here that could improve the confidence because the Israeli public and the Palestinian public don't believe anymore. And, but I think this is too strategically important. These two countries are too much history, too little geography. They are fated to be together. <clears throat> there has to be gradual steps. If there were time, I would be able to enumerate what I think the gradual steps are. Okay, thank you, David. Um, to Sam, I want to take advantage of the fact that um, you're with us uh, calling in from the Emirates to help um, uh, our viewers understand the process that, that Barbara laid out in terms of this gradual um, uh, uh, normalizing in the minds of Emiratis um, uh, of what this means. But can it explain to, you know, so many people say, ah, oh, Emirates, just another regional autocracy. The, the ruler says X and the people jump 10 feet high. Um, but we all know that, that uh, uh, even in, um, uh, uh, you know, sheikhdoms and monarchies, um, uh, it doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to acculturize your, your, your peoples, you have to normalize things in the ideas of your, your fellow leaders. How, do, how did this really work? Or how is this working in the Emirates? The process of, of buy-in from the political elite, the educated elite, and the populace. This process of buy-in to the idea of, of uh, uh, a normal relationship with Israel. How did that work? And how is it working in your view? Well, uh, Rob, you know, you have been raised in, in a different narrative that Israel is an enemy, okay? In the, in the curriculum, in the preaching, in the, uh, yeah, it wasn't easy, but UAE, you know, it contains 200 nationalities. How to run those peacefully, okay? So it didn't come out of the sudden one day. Uh, with Abrahamic accord, okay? UAE adapt, having uh, the church beside synagogue, beside mosque, beside uh, uh, Hindu Tom. So this, and in fact, UAE also wasn't closed in terms of social uh, freedom. It's every day, everybody. And you know, and other knows, this did not start just uh, last night. As I mentioned before, started since uh, mid of 90s. This relation, and it was, uh, uh, bilateral interests between two parts in terms of security, in terms of uh, common threat they are uh, sharing. So that was came normally when, when this ha happened, it wasn't a shock because it has been, they opened the synagogue before they invited in, in terms of, uh, door was there in arena, uh, representative office, uh, through sport, uh, through many visitors came, ministers. So slowly, slowly, people accepted that announcement. It wasn't a shock, I won't say for all of them, but for most of them. And in fact, also young generation hasn't been raised under that narrative. Like my generation or older, generation has been that. They've been, uh, uh, and then when I grow up also, in fact, my my first visit to the United States was with Fulbright um, Grant. My sponsor was a Jewish, American Jewish, Nathan Brown, and he introduced me to Jewish community. And from that, I get communicated. Then I meet them in conferences where I met Dor or others. So I didn't find that I am meeting people coming from space. They're normal people, they can share <laughs> with them. And I think also the young generation has the same. Uh, 
with the social media, with this uh, information technology, talking to each other. So it is, uh, I will say, paving the road for more uh, normalization with this. And UAE by itself, it doesn't belong to a rich uh, sect of Islam. Mainly it's belonging to Maliki, which is uh, more leaning towards Sufism, but it is the, the most moderate uh, sect in Islam. So here the, the environment, the ground is, is uh, willing to normalize with others, uh, um, no matter their faith, their race, their language, gender, whatever. It's, 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 it's a, a state of tolerance. Okay, very good. Well, um, I, I apologize, we've run out of time. We, um, we try to be prompt at the Washington Institute. There's so much more detail that we could go into because the implications of what is going to happen tomorrow really are, are seismic. Um, uh, and I think we've only begun to imagine um, the opportunities. Uh, and to be fair, I think we've only begun to see the challenges um, from both within societies and from the critics and the opponents. So um, uh, we will, um, uh, with great pleasure, be, be bringing this group back together, uh, along with other experts from around the region and here in Washington. Um, but uh, for today, uh, please allow me to thank uh, Dr. Ibtisam el um, Ambassador Dory Gold, and my colleagues, Ambassador Barbara Leaf and David Makovsky. Thank you very much for joining us today at the Washington Institute.